Well, welcome to our inal grand rounds. Uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, our special speaker, you know, today. We have our own Dr. Uh, Daniel Batie. Uh, so I'm going to give an introduction for those uh, who are not uh, familiar. So Dr. Batie is the Earl Del Greco Levin Professor of Medicine and Hypertension at Northwestern. Um, he has been a professor of medicine at Northwestern for over 30 years and chief of our division um, for 18 years, uh, between 92 and 2009. His clinical and research interests include acid-based disturbances, electrolyte disorders, hypertension, and diabetic kidney disease. Uh, Dr. Batia has been extremely productive. Uh, he has more than 250 publications, 60 book chapters, uh, and he has been an um, inventor and co-inventor uh, for several patents. Uh, his research actually is focused on studying uh, the renin angiotensin system, and more specifically, enzymes that decrease angiotensin II, such as ACE2. His laboratory has actually made novel variants of phase two that have potential therapeutic use for kidney disease and um, for the prevention and treatment of COVID-19. Uh, so looking forward to your seminar, Dr. Batia. Thank you. Thank you, Penelope. Thank you very much. All right, so you have the topic of my talk. I hope everybody can hear me. And welcome to this beautiful autumn day in Chicago. This is a picture that uh, Barry Butler puts on um, Twitter all the time. And I follow him on Twitter and always has great pictures of Chicago. I think, OK, my disclosures, are you guys? I guess I'm not projecting to the screen. Something went wrong. It's very sensitive, you touch yes, anything. I know. The thing is like, just use the arrows and the pointer. That's okay, it. I'll try not to. if you move it, then Okay. So, now, let's just start after my disclosure slide, which I have to do because really some of the work we do now, we have patents and a company, so those are my disclosures. Let's just start by introducing to the people that don't know what is H2. Is uh, peptidase a monopeptidase that hydrolyzes angiotensin II and other peptides like apelins, uh, there's arginine bradykinin, and that was discovered in the year 2000 and that by two groups separately. One is by Tony Turner, which is the one that gave me this slide here, and um, that name came because it's very similar or has some homology, 60% homology with uh, uh, ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme 1. And what you need to know is that the regular inhibitors of ACE do not do any direct action on, on ACE2 and that the actions are just the opposite, whereas ACE promotes the formation of angiotensin 2, ACE2 promotes the dissipation. So it has two different enzymes all together. So the tension, two years after it was discovered, there were a couple of publications in high-impact journals, like this one by, by Penninger, showing that it was important for the heart and there was a lot of attention. Then the knockout that had all this uh, dysfunction of the heart was not totally replicated. And the interest continued in the renal or renin angiotensin uh, community. But as you can see here in this slide that was provided to me by Brian Bird, you can see that the number of clicks over the last 20, uh, 20 years was moderate, and then all of a sudden comes COVID in 2000, 2001, and 2022, and you have all this massive attention because it was discovered that it was the receptor for SARS-CoV-2. So there is a before and after. Before we were focusing on H2 as this enzyme 
that converts angiotensin II to 117, and, and after in below here, where we have an enzyme that is the receptor for COVID-2. So let's place ACE2 in the context of the renin angiotensin system. Everything starts with angiotensinogen, produced in the liver. Then comes renin, produced by the kidneys, and you form angiotensin 1, which has 10 amino acids. Then comes ACE, and a little bit of kinase in some tissues, and you form uh, angiotensin 2, which is the main biologic peptide, and has only eight amino acids. Then come three enzymes that are capable of metabolizing angiotensin 1A to 1.7. And these enzymes include ACE2, and actually ACE2 of the three is the most potent. So now you have angiotensin 1.7, that can also be formed by alternative pathways, like this neprilysin pathway. Angiotensin 1 can go to 1,9 by the action of ACE2. And by the action of ACE, you can form angiotensin 1,7 as well. And then comes ACE again, ACE is always a main actor, it seems, and you can dissipate 1,7 and form 1,5. So that's the main uh, situation. It's more complex because there is another arm here on the other side driven by aminopeptidase A that metabolizes angiotensin II, also very powerful. But today we are going to center here on the actions of ACE2. So what ACE2 does is simply split this terminal amino acid, phenylalanine, to form angiotensin 1,7. And in doing that, you go from the bad actions of angiotensin 2. Everything angiotensin 2 in the chronic state tends to be bad, so to speak. Too much fibrosis, inflammation. On the other hand, acutely, is a lifesaver, right? Because maintains the blood pressure when you are bleeding and so forth. But in chronic states like diabetes, chronic kidney disease, too much angiotensin too, particularly locally within the kidney, is a bad thing and would be nice to get rid of it. So where is H2 located? The first thing I need to emphasize is it's a tissue enzyme and is really in the cell membrane. The form that's in the cell membrane, we call it the full length H2, here in the middle, and as you can see in the red, has a transmembrane domain that anchors it to the cells. It is, uh, has this uh, catalytic domain that provides the enzymatic activity. But then there are uh, ways to produce the soluble form of H2 in the upper tracing, and really there are uh, enzymes, uh, ADAM17, maybe ADAM10, that cut it and form a soluble form that circulates in a small amounts. In blood, you can find it in the urine, you can find it in other body fluids. But the important one is the tissue bound in the cell membrane. Now, what organs have H2? The answer is the majority of organs have plenty of H2, but there are relative uh, abundances between one organ, the GI tract, the intestine has tons of it, the kidney has tons of it, the heart has substantial amounts. But guess what? The lungs have very little H2. How do we know that? Well, before the pandemic, uh, one of my students from Germany, Peter Serfoso, published this paper where we saw that there was an enzyme called PEEP or POP that actually is more abundant in plasma and in the lungs especially, whereas H2 was very little H2 in the lungs. But that's looking at the big picture. You do a staining of the lungs, you do Westerns looking for H2, and you barely can detect it. 
that doesn't mean that it's not there. Actually, it's there and it's critically important in these epithelial cells of the alveoli called type 2 pneumocytes, which are the ones that the virus seems to love, and that's how it gets mainly into the body through these cells in the nasopharyngeal epithelia that also have H2 and these type 2 pneumocytes. And that's a picture of these type 2 pneumocytes here uh, in the arrow pointing out where H2 is in the lungs. The kidneys have tons of H2. This is a paper we published at the very beginning many years ago showing in the red in the middle a lot of H2 in the epical border of the proximal tubule and colocalizes with ACE, and that gives you this nice yellow merging. There is some H2 in the podocytes, shown here by immunogol staining or labeling of glomeruli. And I will not talk a lot about pathophysiology or disease states where H2 seems to be too low or alter in relation to ACE. I'll just mention this study we did years ago where you can see the upper panel on the right that there is more ACE in a diabetic mice glomeruli, and in the lower panel you can see that there is less ACE2, less staining. Now that, from what we know, is not a good combination, right? If you have an overexpression of an enzyme that forms angiotensin II, like ACE, and one that uh, destroys it in small amounts, that all favors the accumulation of angiotensin II in the tissues and is a bad, uh, a bad situation if when angiotensin II is formed locally or is filtered from the circulation. So we thought that's a bad, a bad thing, a bad combination. Let's test it experimentally. There were a couple of H2 inhibitors. One is this MLN compound, which is the one that we use. We gave it to mice. And after weeks of this inhibitor, the mice developed more proteinuria. The kidneys show mesangial expansion. That's the lesion you see in diabetes, but worse. And interestingly, as shown here in this glomeruli on the right, the one, that's a st the one on the upper panel shows more A's. And below, you see a glomerular arterial where you also see in the endothelial layer more A's. So these two enzymes, very interestingly, go in opposite direction. When you have low A's, you have high A's too in pathophysiologic conditions. So again, a very bad combination, right? You take away ACE2 and you have more ACE, that's not a good way to protect the kidneys or anywhere else. So another way to look at this issue is to try to introduce ACE2 into the glomerulus. And at that time we were collaborating with Kevin Burns who had a transgenic cell line and he did actually all the work and what he found is that in this transgenic, when you make them diabetic by this STZ, they develop more, I mean less, damage. The differences are small, but they were significant. So just compare, for instance, here, this STZ mice that's transgenic, which is protected, compared to the other one next to it that has the darker, uh, more matrix, more mesangial expansion. And in the upper panels, you show that there is a statistical significance. Not a huge benefit, but was consistent with the proof of concept that getting more H2 would be a good thing. So over the last decade, people have uh, tried different approaches to introduce more H2 into the body, and I will not discuss those that were reviewed with Alonso Market a couple of years ago. There are a mini circuit delivery, there is administration of recombinant proteins. People have tried so-called H2 activators, which would be ideal, but actually they are not real activators of H2. So 
what I'll talk today is what about a recombinant H2 protein. So we had this recombinant H2 protein produced from mouse so that we could give it without formation of antibodies for longer duration. Because the human one, if you give it to mice after two weeks, there is formation of antibodies that are neutralizing. So in this study, what Jan Wasaki showed is that there was actually no effect of this overexpression of H2 for several weeks. And you see that the GFR, which is high because diabetic mice hyperfilter, is unaffected by the treatment. No changes on glomerular area, mesangial expansion, or even glomerular cellularity. So it's a perfectly negative study. Published in KI, and we got an editorial. Why? Why? Well, because we introduced the concept that the problem was that this recombinant H2 is too large to get through the kidney. You can see the serum levels, which are very high, but the kidney doesn't get them, and neither does the urine. So you have a large molecule that would be great if you were trying angiotensin II excess in the blood. You infuse angiotensin II, you give this molecule, you dissipate H2, and you have a fantastic action. However, if you do it for an early kidney disease where angiotensin II in the blood is not elevated, you don't get anything. So that was the impetus to think a little bit, what about trying a shorter form of ACE2? And actually, this is only a recent editorial of work over the years, but there is a little bit of a shorter form of ACE2 in the urine with 65, that's probably a degradation product of the, the larger forms. I will not get you all the details. That gave us a little bit the idea that maybe what we needed to do is bioengineer proteins that are shorter enough that when infused, pass the glomerular filtration barrier. And that's when uh, Jan Wasaki start cutting the soluble H2 that we had with 740 amino acids from the terminal end with the idea of producing a form that's still enzymatically active, but shorter. And in these uh, studies, two mouse forms of H2 were produced, one with 619 amino acids, one with 605, that were perfectly active. I will not show you the same thing we've replicated later, but with human forms, which obviously therapeutically are the ones that we want to use. And using radio imaging, we demonstrated that the forms that are shorter, here the 619 and the other one 605, when you infuse them, <clears throat> they give you a nice parenchymal rim here even a little bit stronger in the shorter of 605. Whereas the 740, it gives you only background. The red is the liver, where eventually all this H2 goes to the liver. But part of that gets to the kidneys and there is uptake. How do we know that there is uptake? Well, that was an interesting experiment where what we did is infused it to mice that doesn't have any H2, the H2 knockout. Any H2 that you recover in the urine has to be the exogenous one that you are infusing. And as you can see here in the right panel, there is some recovery of H2 in the urine. And if you use a blocker of proximal tubular transport called L lysine, you get even more. That tells you A, that was filtered, and B, that was taken up to some extent by the proximal tubule. The other piece of evidence is that when you measure H2 activity in this model that has zero H2, when you infuse it, 
you get H2 in the kidney. It's the left panel. And the right panel shows the formation of angiotensin 1-7 in vivo in animals that have been pre-infused by this uh, H2 truncate. That is more angiotensin 2 than in animals that are treated with uh, vehicle, PBS, or animals that have been treated with uh, 740, which is the larger form. So the blue are the animals treated with the um, shorter H2. So that's the new approach, right? We use, it's mandatory that if you have a patient with diabetes or diabetic kidney disease, mm, cardiovascular disease, the guidelines tell you that you should use an ACE or an ARP. Upstream of angiotensin II, those are well tolerated, very effective medications. The, even Al Skerin, which has a bad reputation, is uh, in the right context, is appropriate. But it's all upstream of angiotensin II. The approach of providing ACE2 in the yellow is to destroy angiotensin II to prevent its accumulation. And the idea is to find a therapeutic niche for this therapy. Now, where to start? I mean, the potential, you know, there are so many indications where blocking the RAS, or in this case, fostering the degradation of angiotensin II is potentially uh, attractive. So one model is AKI. AKI is a very still important vaccine problem for which there is no treatment. We just had an outstanding talk by Penelope last week or two weeks ago. But the reality is that there is no treatment for AKI. Now, tackling the renin angiotensin system, which is a friendly system that we know the side effects and is not uh, uh, that complicated, may be a nice approach. Well, the impetus for that came from many reasons, but now we have data by Mina Shirasi that is here in the audience showing that in the model of AKI caused by ischemia reperfusion, 30 minutes, 48 hours, there is a depletion of H2 protein, as shown by the Western blood. So now we have another impetus to give more H2 because for some reason, there is less H2 in AKI. Now, this is work that was done and presented at ASM before the pandemic in AS 2019, and we want to finish soon, hopefully. The main finding is both at 24 and 48 hours, the GFR is improved if you pretreat these animals 30 minutes before with our short H2 truncate. And interestingly, if you look at the upper panels, I was mentioning this falling H2 before. When you give more H2, you seem to prevent it. So you are giving something that's lacking, which always makes the therapy more attractive. And in the process on the right, you see that the kidney itself, that normally has very little 1.7, has more angiotensin 1.7 as the potential mechanism of benefit therapeutically. That is, you get away from angiotensin 2 and you form 1.7. You get away from all this fibrotic, oxidative stress, inflammatory effects of angiotensin 2 and you go to 1.7 that has the opposite effects, anti-inflammatory, or perhaps there are hemodynamic effects that should be studied as well. So now we have a short truncate of H2 that's effective in this model, but wait a minute, last few hours. So any therapy that's injectable in only last a few hours, it works in the ICU, but we would like to make something that's more, um, more attractive for longer duration of action. So that's when uh, Yang Wasaki again came up with a model where you could fuse this protein, the 619, and other truncates that we have right now, with the albumin binding domain. 
and the alpine binding domain is a short protein that still gets you a size of about 75 kD that passes the glomerular filtration barrier, whereas the control here would never pass the glomerular filtration barrier. So we want to try that. And the way this protein works is a bit complicated, but you have a fused protein that uses the receptor here. The ABD is a receptor domain for the albumin, and in a non-covalent fashion, piggyback with albumin. Albumin has an extended duration of action, 21 days. So you get a few more days of duration of action when you have this new fused protein. And that's the evidence in the red. You can see as compared to other proteins of short duration of action that it lasts. We have a, an assay that measures enzymatic activity. And you can see here that at three days, it's coming down, but still 100 is a lot as compared to zero. So you still have a hefty level of H2 activity to protect whatever it is that you are trying to protect. And when given every three days, you have here evidence that you still have very high levels. So we've been able to manage to create something that can be given every three or four days. Now, all this is great, and then comes COVID. I don't know how I'm doing time, because now I'm going to focus on COVID. COVID hits, was all very fast, the first three months of 2020, the whole world community focused and taught us how to do research in a way that people of my generation were not doing. I published a paper that it takes me three years, from the inception to the time. Here, I learned that people can produce data in a week and publish in a week through the preprints. And it was all justifiable because everybody is trying to cure uh, COVID. So you had the preprints and you could write, and I had a collaborator that told me, you give me the data with your protein, and if it works, I'll publish the paper to you in two days. So just to tell you a little bit, you know, the, the learning experience of working in this uh, disease. So what we knew? We knew that in the previous slide were the highlights of how it was discovered that uh, SARS-CoV-2 uses H2 as the receptor. Now I'll show you this cartoon of how it really works. So comes the corona with all the spikes, and in the blue you have the H2 receptors in the cell membrane. That alone would not be sufficient. A paper by Hoffman showed that that's all great, but unless you have this protein with a long name that I can never pronounce, the transmembrane protease serine 2, TMPRSS2, you need to activate the complex for internalization. And when you do it, then H2 and the spikes, everything internalizes, and then the host has the virus and it starts the replication using the host. But you gotta get into the cell, right? And the idea is that in the process, this H2 that was there goes away. Is that true? Well, there is some data that supports that. Back before uh, SARS-CoV-2 was even um, a problem, uh, this group had shown that SARS-CoV-1 infection that also uses uh, the same receptor, uh, the infection, here the wild type, when it's infected, behaves like a knockout. So if you believe this data, here it is. You have lung tissue, you deplete of H2 in the process of infecting. And that in itself could be detrimental, right? because we've been talking all this time that H2 is a protective enzyme. So be nice perhaps to give more H2 just because of that. However, that's not the main thing. The main thing is to use the decoy effect that's explained in this cartoon that is an idea that shows that if you could give soluble H2 that retains the same sequence, the same 
sequence that recognizes the receptor binding domain of the spike, but you inundate the system with so much soluble H2 that all these spikes could be covered. Next time I make the slide, I'll make that all the spikes are covered. I don't know whether that happens or not, but to produce the visual effect. You want to cover all these spikes to intercept the, the corona virus, the spikes from finding the natural receptor, which is the one in the cell membrane. So the idea is to overwhelm the system in such a way that the spikes never get to the cell membrane bound H2, which one that's going to cause the problem. And why is this safe? Well, the soluble H2 does not have the transmembrane domain that anchors uh, the protein to the cell. So, at least on theoretical grounds, that's a perfectly safe approach. So we went through the phases, you know, how it works and how slow is the process from preclinical to clinical, and we still are preclinical. Now, organoids are kidney, vascular, lung organoids are very popular these days. It's an improved cell model, and when you look at them under here, the microscope, it looks almost like these are proximal tubules. We got those from Jason Berheim, who is now in Arizona, but was an investigator here at Northwestern. And we stain them, and you see that that looks like the epical proximal tubule. Not bad for an organoid. So we use this model, like another group had done before us, to show that when you expose them to different proteins, H2 proteins, you can completely neutralize them neutralize the infection. That's an infected organoid exposed to SARS-CoV-2, and those are organoids that are exposed to the protein, pre-exposure to the virus. I mean, you do it in a way that's going to favor your proof of concept. That's how research works for you, typically. For something to work, you first use the more ideal conditions. So here you have complete neutralization of the virus by the soluble H2 proteins. But obviously, all the money is in, not that COVID doesn't cause kidney problems, but that's a different lecture. Let's focus now on the entry site, which is this type two pneumocytes here in the lungs. Here, right? So reviewers, you know, for the papers, the grants that get rejected, they all want lung organoids. So we collaborated with a group in New York that gave us the organoids, or actually they did the infections themselves, and showing that both viral RNA for SARS-CoV-2 and the plaque assays, when you use uh, a large concentration of our protein, the one that Jan Wasaki designed, you have a complete neutralization in lung organoids. And then came another collaboration, but all of that was put together as a package in a paper in cell, that the other collaborators had kidney organoids depleted of H2, or deficient of H2. And then is the question, a fundamental question, can you infect a cell or a human a being or a living person or animal or whatever without H2? And the answer is no. You can see here that zero, they are inoculated, they are exposed to the virus, but you never get anything. Demonstrating the essential nature of H2 as the main receptor, because there are other proteins out there that are being uh, uh, published, and I'm sure they are right, at least most of them, that they are receptors for H2. But here we show the essentiality of H2. That's the wild type, and the wild type, bam, gets infected, and you need the high protein to neutralize it. So essentiality. So what's the ideal attribute of an H2 decoy protein? 
we think the best is the affinity for SARS-CoV-2. The more affinity, the better. Having prolonged duration of action is an important plus because the holiday, the holiday, the, the virus doesn't take holidays. So if you give it and then you spend X number of hours that you don't have the protein, the virus will take advantage. And we think that retaining H2 enzymatic activity is another important feature. So to get such a protein, uh, it turns out that our truncate that we were working, this H2618, was okay at high doses, but it's a monomer and is unlikely to be as good as a protein that's a dimer, that has more surface, more ability to cover the spikes of the virus. So to create a dimer, a dimer uh, Jan used this DDC, is a 12 amino acid compound that forms a link and now all of a sudden you have a dimer. And this turns out to be more effective as shown here in the red that the binding affinity for SARS-CoV-2 is more than the green which is the monomer. So we decided to try that in vivo and you see the duration of action. The red is more duration of action than the green or the blue. So now we have a protein that has high binding and extended duration of action. Let's test it in animal models. For that, you require a facility where uh, these animals can be infected. In Chicago, there was only one, the Ricketts facility at the University of Chicago, and that's where, luckily, we did the work, although we had tremendous delays because we had the mice and we didn't have the, the readiness to go and do the work, so we lost months and money. But we did it, and we used this transgenic mice that has the human H2 introduced and is infectable. Now, rodents, rats, typically are not. There are tricks. Now, people use mouse-adapted variants that can be infected, but a regular mice or a rat is not infectable. The, the receptor of the rodents is different from humans, and the virus does not recognize it. Hamsters... Ferrets and cats and God, are infectable. I don't hear a lot of cats dying from, but they are infectable. So that was our protocol, and it's all the work that really Louise Hasler uh, did. It's so sensitive. Every moment I move. Okay, so let me show you the data. Every time I touch the computer, I. I lose the, the slides. Thank you. I think I gotta go back. I like to show this slide. Let's see. Okay, so those are the results. It's the connection, I think. Maybe we should try the other computer, I don't know. Okay, I apologize. Hopefully it's going to work from now on. So now we have these infected mice. I think the problem is with the computer because I'm not even touching anything. Do you guys have any questions while we try to sort it out? Penelope.
Right. Okay, there's so much to this question. The first part of the question, I repeat it, is a little bit, do you know why there is less H2 in AKI? I can tell you that we have data at the mRNA level that there is a decrease in mRNA early on, right? But we think that that's not just that. We think that with a proximal tubular injury, which is typical of all models of AKI, there may be some shedding, either normal shedding or pathologic shedding, and a lot of that may be lost in the urine. And now we are looking at the urine to see if we can recover it. So mechanistically, more or less, I'm giving you kind of a potential explanation. Now, whether it's ischemia, unique to ischemia, or is more global for AKI, I don't know. Now, what do you do with the other ACE inhibitors? That's the big question because most clinicians, when they have a patient that's going to have a procedure that may cause AKI, are not going to start an ACE inhibitor, even if you tell them that could be a good thing, right? But actually, there are studies that when you look at people that the ACE inhibitor was continued just because it was not stopped, the outcome is better, right? But now we are not going to do an ACE inhibitor, which we know the side effects and the potential, uh, you know, the, brain, the, the hemodynamic effect, the ferron efferon arterial, that blocking angiotensin II in the efferon arterial is a bad thing when you have ischemia. With ACE2, that may not be a problem but we haven't gotten anyone yet that wants to do this type of hemodynamic studies that uh, very few people do these days. So let me see whether that's going to work now. You have a protocol where you give it before the soluble protein, and then, as a reminder, 24 and 48 hours later. And you give it to a model that, if you don't do anything, has fulminant, fulminant infection and is going to die. The untreated animals in the black, they are all dead by day five or six. Whereas the treated animals in the green, they have 90% survival. Only one animal died at the, at the end. And if you look at another uh, parameter, I think here is the, the weight which comes down. These animals are so sick. You see the weight loss that's prevented by the treatment. And then when you look at the lungs, you see in the upper panels a lot of mononuclear infiltrates that get much better in the treated animals by day 6 and 14. And in the lower panel, you see there is a lot of alveolar edema and hemorrhage that also is much better by day 6 and 14 in the treated animals. So it's one of these experiments that was black and white. Uh, the data was totally clear. Now, as a nephrologist, we look at this model to see what happened at the kidney, and not a lot happens, that's the truth. But nevertheless, some animals have, as you show here in the two untreated panels, and if you look at the tubules in the black, you'll see loss of the proximal uh, border, right, attenuation, and you see it, uh, in the white arrow is a, a sign of apoptosis, which was confirmed by staining, separate from that. So there is some evidence of proximal tubular injury in this model that is, goes away with the treatment. I'm not saying that the treatment goes to the kidney and solves the problem. I'm saying that solving the infection solves the kidney problem as well. But that's something that needs to be characterized better because, as I said, the, the variability, we, sometimes we see a normal kidney in these uh, in, in animals that are infected and untreated. Now, using markers, you know, I don't know what you think about the Kim and the Engel, 
But it's very interesting that in these animals, we always get engal staining when they are untreated. And as you see below in the two panels, um, no, those are all untreated animals. You always see engal positive, and the chem sometimes is negative, which means normal on the left, or you see in the green that there is a staining for chem. So I think it's probably more specific for proximal tubular injury, but engal always gives us uh, stainings which go away in the treated animals. So that would be the summary. Using our soluble H2 protein, and I gotta say that the field has now exploded and many investigators are using different soluble H2 proteins and they report uh, similar findings. Um, we find this kind of decreased lung and brain titers, by the way, the brain titers and the lung titers go away. That's, I didn't show you the data. And this improvement in the survival and the lung and kidney injury. So the message that I like to really uh, impart, so to speak, here is that H2 is essential for the infection. And moreover, the treatment with the soluble H2 protein provides a universal approach to this, the treatment of this disease. What do we mean by universal? In this study that was finally published in Jason, you can see that we tested different strains of SARS-CoV-2, the wild type on the red, the, then we tested, um, our protein is tested here, the red, but there's another protein that also work in the blue. The point I wanna make is that the delta, the beta, and the well type, they are all responding to the protein. And now we have data with Omicron, that's the prevalent variant that we didn't have then to test, that works like a champion for Omicron as well. Actually, for Omicron works even better at lower concentrations. So that's not the same as antibodies. Here you have the scheme I showed you before where the idea is to cover all these spikes with the soluble H2 in the red. And here is what antibodies do. Antibodies are also effective until there is a, body, a, a mutation of the receptor binding domain of the spike. Then all of the sudden antibodies against Omicron and all these variants are no longer effective. So we think the soluble H2 has this attribute until now of being a more uh, universal approach to uh, the treatment and prevention of this disease. Okay, great question. I didn't give all the secrets. Not everything is published, but I'll tell you because I like you. I like you too, it works much better when you give it by inhalation, directly to the lung, and in a way that it also goes to the brain, intranasal. Now we have data that we haven't published, but definitely when you give it uh, intraperitoneal to achieve a systemic level, it works maybe at best 20 or 30 percent of the time. Whereas when we give it by inhalation, it's 100 percent. So yeah, you want to go to the organ that's affected. For the kidney, now we are playing, or not playing, working very seriously with another modification that's ideal because it's short and uh, is very effective for, for uh, to get into the kidney as well. So this is all a working process. Okay, the second question. This may not be the most thoughtful question, but why are those, if H2 is so important, why are those other proteins so important? The port of entry. Port of entry is just the lungs and the nasopharyngeal. There is, you don't need tons of H2. The virus seems to be happy the moment that sees a little bit of a receptor. That's what the virus does, and you don't need tons of H2. But 
what you are saying, that's, the, my answer is very simple, but that's, at the beginning, everybody was confused by that, but what is, you need a lot of H2, no. You don't need a lot of H2, you just need some H2 for the virus to get in at the right place. And the virus is definitely, we are all exposed through the upper respiratory tract. But let me thank the people that's done all the work here because I'm here ready for more questions. Here you have uh, my uh, people that in the lab has worked on that all these years with their names and uh, outside collaborators that has worked with us in the last couple of years. I just wanted to thank especially to these two people, uh, Jan Wasaki, that has done all this work with proteins and everything else in the lab, and uh, Louise Hasler, that really has done all the work with COVID. She's a student from Germany and has spent about almost two years. She just went back to Germany yesterday. So and now I have a different team. Some are front row here all lined up. Thank you. And uh, thank you all. Hope you have more questions. But how could I forget my grandchild? OK. Totally. So this is a mouse model that has the human uh, H2 gene introduced, and that's why uh, they get this fulminant disease. But this is not a very perfect model for many reasons. Let me tell you the weakness of the model. It's great for the initial studies because it's fulminant lethal, and in five days you get an answer whether your treatment works or not but then has a maldistribution, and it's very important, of the human gene that differs from the natural distribution of H2. The natural distribution is a lot in the kidney and very little in the lungs, whereas here is the opposite. You have a mice that you have introduced a lot of H2 in the lungs, right? I'm not totally contradicting myself. Right? I'm not. But now is, is an artificial model that has more H2 in the lungs and very H2 in the kidneys. And maybe that's one of the reasons that we see uh, mild kidney disease. On the other hand, you talk to all the people that have done work with this. Uh, uh, large databases and pulling data of patients with AKI in the ICUs, and many people think that a lot is bread and butter AKI, right? At first, we all thought here's the virus, and we wrote editorials and things, but now that we have two or three years of experience, a lot of the AKI that you see in COVID patients is because they are so sick and they have a low blood pressure, you put them on the respirator, and everything escalates, right? But I'm not ruling out or saying that the virus doesn't have a direct effect on the kidney. But we've written review papers, and it's very hard to find that some groups that keep reporting it. Marias has a lot of data in this model, and we see tons 
in the brain, the kidney, and none in the kidney. So we need perhaps better models that replicate the human kidney disease. I don't know where we on time with all the interruptions and the glitches and everything, with all the glitches in the computer. This is so sensitive that you get close to it and you lose everything. Let me see.